you could say, you might even call it three quarters of the team of people who conceived of and brought the idea uh, to market known as the SwiftLink 232. Uh, Noel Nyman, who is, if you view it as three people, the, the third third, he was here earlier and traffic was terrible getting here. We were at least an hour delayed arriving and I think he thought maybe something had gone wrong so he, I think, took off for home. So he's not here to help present with us, which is uh, a real shame. And then the other person, as you'll see in a little bit, is a guy named Rick Washburn that uh, I went to college with. He helped in the very early stages of the project. But he, unlike Noel and Brian and me, didn't end up moving or living here, so he was not part of the project. He was from the East Office. The East <laughs> Office. Yeah, we were <laughs> we were big time, weren't we? Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about a product, as I said a minute ago, called the SwiftLink 232. How many of you have heard of it before? Wow, not zero, but close. <laughs> I think that's true. The SwiftLink 232. Have you heard of it before? No. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So the, <laughs> the subtitle to this is a modem. What's that? Because people like my son Kyle's age and this young man's age, and you're probably in the same zone too, and you have never used a modem, I'm guessing, right? You may have seen one somewhere, but you've yeah. probably never used one. So uh, this was a product back in the days when modems were very much a thing. So we're going to talk to you about that. Uh, let me get this arranged so I can use my mouse a little better. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Yes. So this is what the SwiftLink 232 was. Uh, it was a cartridge for the Commodore 64 and 128. I imagine at a gathering such as this that is about Commodores, most people are reasonably aware of the way that Commodores work and look and where you can plug things in and all that yeah. sort of jazz, right? So it plugs in the cartridge port. Back. Yes, in the back uh, right. Um, the text at the right, which I'm not going to read because I think people that read slides in a presentation should be summarily shot, <laughs> uh, right. is from the marketing uh, blurb for the product back in the day. Um, so it was brought to market in order to uh, help Commodore 64s and 128s uh, perform with faster modems that were becoming uh, a thing and coming on the market. When, when I got into the Commodore 64, my brother and mother bought mine for me in 1983, I think. Um, and then I went to college a year and a half later. Uh, 300 baud was basically it. There were a few 1200 baud services, but they often were premium. And so I had a Pokey 300 baud modem. Uh, Brian, what was your first yeah. modem? 300. Yeah. And those of you who have used Commodores a long time, they do all start with 300s, right? Mm -hmm. Well, as I, I was at Purdue University in Indiana, and as uh, time went on very quickly, just the four years I was there, 1985 to 89, uh, the situation changed quite a bit in terms of what modems you could buy and how inexpensive or expensive they were. Uh, and being on the campus, we also started to have the opportunity to connect to fairly high speed sorts of things. And Commodore never made a modem, uh, let me think about this, I may get my facts wrong. I know they made 312, three Commodore never made a 2400 baud modem. No, they did not, right? not a 2400. Right, but 2400s, I re if I remember right, by the time I was about getting ready to graduate from college, were fairly reasonably priced. 9600 baud was still something that only super rich friends owned. Um, but uh, the poor old Commodore 64 and 128, even though it was such an amazing machine, and I have out here with me today my C128D that I bought new in 1989 after I moved out here. Uh, there was one pretty big deficiency when you think about chips inside the machine. And I should back up a second. Of course, Commodore had an advantage in many ways from other, some other uh, micro, uh, computer companies in that they owned a chip foundry, right? Everybody know what the name of that is? Moss Technology. Uh, Commodore, I don't, I don't know the whole story, I don't have it memorized, but they were basically a calculator company, if I remember right, and they bought Moss sometime in the early 70s. Um, 
And that may be the reason that Commodore eventually located where they did in Pennsylvania, because I think Moss was already there, if I've got my story right. Could be wrong about that. But in any case, Commodore could make chips about as cheaply as anybody. I mean, like brand new chips, right? You know, design a chip and get it into production, because they owned the whole thing, stem to stern. Um, but does anybody know, among the 65XX family of chips that are inside the Commodore 64 and 120, what did they leave out that seems like such a glaring uh, thing to do when you get to 1989. RS-232. Yeah, yeah, the UART, if you will, which Commodore also called an ACIA, a synchronous communication interface adapter, I think, if I remember right. Um, they, had, they had a very nice sound chip and a very nice video chip. That's right. And then they had plugins for your floppy drive or your cassette. That's right. But yeah. if you want to get online, it was all done through software. Yeah, it was all done through software, the, the serial routines. So at that time, you know, the computer was being designed, I assume, 1981, 82, really hit the market in a big way in 83. 300 baud was fast enough. The, the serial routines in software could do that. It could mostly do 1,200. You could kind of do 2,400 on a Commodore 128 in 2 megahertz mode if you use the 80-column screen. Uh, but the, their, their modems also, they. They had the game cartridge and it, so you just jam it into the Commodore without a cord. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's all. So we saw a business opportunity. Uh, if any of you have heard of our little company before, we've been out of business since 1991 or something like that. But we made a couple of hardware peripherals with Commodore. The first one was the SID Symphony stereo cartridge, which I brought one out here. It was just added another SID chip, pretty easy to do. And then we saw this opportunity potentially for helping Commodore people get online with 2400 baud and faster modems. And so that's what this cartridge does. We're going to go into the details here, but it basically puts the chip that they left out of the architecture back into the memory map so that you can then talk to it and do much, much faster serial communication. Was it like America Online, BBS system, I think they were exclusively Commodore. No, uh, the predecessor to America Online, Quantum Link. Quantum Link, yeah, yeah. Quantum Link, you, you, you had to have a Commodore computer. That's right. And, and they, they were experimenting with how to do more than 1,200 baud, but they didn't see a way to do it in software. Right. Yeah. But then it, suddenly there was lots of bulletin board companies, and everybody wanted to get on a bulletin board. Yeah. And you're right. not going to do that without a good motor. Yeah. Unless you're really patient. <laughs> Which we all were back in the day. OK. So uh, I've said a little bit of this already, but you know, when you look at something that happened 25, 30 years ago, it's kind of easy to take it out of context. I'm like, man, what a cool idea that just came out of nowhere, right? Well, no. There were all these things that already existed or had happened that we were aware of. And sometimes, just kind of speaking about innovation in general, sometimes when you do something, it's because you have some domain knowledge, you, you know that a problem exists, and you're aware of some things that are there, and you're kind of combining the ingredients, you know, stir, pour it in the pan, bake it for at 350 for 45 minutes and bing, you know. And this was kind of one of those products because we had previous experience with this thing called Kermit, a piece of software. Anybody heard of Kermit before? Kermit was, at its base, a file transfer protocol that would communicate between any two computers they could make it work. It, it would allow for different uh, byte sizes and how many parity bits and stop bits, and it was designed really in a university environment so that computers that had no other way of communicating back before the interwebs could at least exchange files. It was very flexible. And once microcomputers became a thing, many different microcomputers got a version of Kermit so that you could dial up. And then pretty soon people didn't want to just transfer files. They wanted to also have something called terminal emulation. That's a phrase we haven't used in a long time. But you wanted to sit at home or in your dorm room and be able to type instead of having to go to the computer lab in the cold weather. You could weather. remote in. You could remote in. And so, work from home. Commodore Kermit, yes, work all the time. Commodore Kermit uh, had terminal emulation for a DEC VT52 terminal, and then later a VT100. So my roommate, Ray Mooney, um, who was involved in some of the stuff we did in Dr. Evil Labs, he adopted Kermit because it was, Kermit software was a very early version of what I would call open source today. It, the source code was freely available. Anybody could modify it, and the only ask is that you recontribute what you change. So, he made a bunch of updates, and so we were aware of this. We knew about, you know, modems, and we were feeling the pain of having slow modems, 
and we were college kids, so we thought we could do anything. I mentioned the stereo cartridge and the 6551. And then the Commodore Plus 4 came out, which there are, there's at least one out there at the show today, right? Very yes. interesting machine because it has the 6551 built into it. So we had an existence proof, if you will, of a Commodore built machine with that chip. But up until then, they were, they were putting the prototype together and their foundry, their designer says, well, we're going to have this chip which will offload all the work of right. uh, telephone communication. The chip's not done yet, so what we'll do is we'll, have, we'll, we'll take a big section of, of the software that's you know, already installed in the machine and it'll use the main CPU to do what they call bit banging where it, it has all these software routines that hog, hog this, the computer. But even up to 300 baud or 1200 baud, it's okay. Right. But beyond that, it's like, forget it. That's right. And since they, the, the software that was in this thing, it was, it was, they had already thought out the chip that would have the real hardware that can just sit and, and process all this communication without interrupting what you're trying to do on the main computer. Right. And so the plus four has the chip already in it, and then we, you know, we are doing it as, as a plug-in. Right. So because the plus four went to market, um, and because we had done the Sid Symphony cartridge, we had a pretty good relationship with a guy that was a key member of the Commodore 64 120 team, a guy named Fred Bowen, who I talked to about a year ago. He's still with oh. us, which is really cool that he's still around. And if I remember right, because he knew we were interested in the Sid Symphony, he contacted us and said, you guys really ought to do a cartridge or something with this modem chip, because hey, we've shipped the plus four, it's in there, big faster modems are coming, you guys should do something. So we're like, okay for it, we'll look into it. And then, you know, faster modem, modems, Brian mentioned Quantum Link. And then, as we got kind of interested in doing it, we found um, a circuit for a ham radio receiver transmitter the guy named Devin Bowen, who we've never met, but we found it out on the whatever ARPANET, I guess, basically, or whatever the network Purdue University was connected to back in the day. Um, and he had just offered that. So here we saw somebody actually describing how to interface the 6551 to a Commodore 64, but he used the expansion port, not the cartridge port, if I remember right. But in any case, we knew it could be done. And then the final thing, Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about the thing that really made it all possible in a cartridge form at a reasonable price, the MAX-232. Oh, yeah, the uh, guts inside the computer, all the chips that are in it, they just ran on a power supply that only has five volts. It's like almost every cell phone, you know, has like a one 3.3 volt battery or 3.6 volt battery. But to send uh, the RS-232 communication was used in huge industrial factories where they might be going thousands of feet. And a good way to do that and not pick up all kinds of arc welder machine interference was if, the, if you had the voltage go way up to 15 volts, beyond zero, and then to negative 15 volts. And so, like in the Sioux Symphony, it was in a similar situation. They had to add a nine, the simplest thing to do is to add a nine volt battery in the cartridge and from time to time pop it open and put a fresh one in. But uh, the MAX-232 chip had a variation of like an inverter that you could plug into your car's cigarette lighter and you could get household power. You know, it had a step up transformer and all this. And so their chip had uh, those two sections at the top and only just a few little cheap capacitors are all you have to do. You don't have to design another circuit board just to make all these voltages. And so they, uh, here, out, here on the outside world, you could have a voltage that would go, you know, maybe all the way 12 volts, negative 12 volts, and all the way up to plus, plus 12. But when you're trying to hook it into the Commodore, or just about any computer, you want the familiar zero or five, and so this has uh, this this handles the the shifting voltages without getting on bad arcing problems and all kinds of smoke coming out. Because the RS two thirty two standard was 
you would you swing, you know, maybe they'd say at least nine volts below, at least negative nine volts, maybe negative 18 volts. Positive nine volts could be as high as, you know, positive 18 volts. This huge voltage swing. And the, uh, you know, for this guy that on the output side, when you want to send those voltages out, well, if you're only sticking five volts in it, how are you supposed to get positive 12 and negative 12? And that's what that section at the top does. Right. So and, and, it, and, it's, and it's this little bug. Tiny little chip, yeah. Yeah. Fits very easily in the cartridge. You never have to add batteries. Right. So it was possible to do before the MAX-232 happened, but, you know, sometimes things come along and you're like, ah, it was really clear that that thing existing was going to make this project a lot more doable. Now, of course, they weren't giving these chips away, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, what effect that had. Um, so design, uh, we won't spend an hour on this, I promise. All this is on our blog, which I'll show you a link to later, but uh, we got to experience the joys of devices and cables that did not adhere to the RS-232 standard very well. So we wanted, we wanted, as somebody shipping a product to a customer, for it to just work for them, right? We didn't want the answer to be, sorry, it doesn't work, your modem sucks, or sorry, it didn't work, your cable sucks, right? So we wanted to try to make it work with as broad a range of things as we could. And we thought, no problem, because we tested on a few that we could get our hands on, everything would work fine. And then we started to send the prototypes out, and wah, wah. But before we get there, maybe, Brian, you could describe the circuit generally. This is the V1 circuit, the very oh, yeah. first thing you prototyped. The, uh, the big guy up there has by far most all the circuits in it. And uh, that's the chip that, that was in the, the plus four, the later model. And nearly every wire in that chip just goes right into the connector on the back. And uh, here's like a simple thing that has to do with you know, clock pulses. Because it, it needs a, a timer. The 6551 needs to know how fast it's supposed to be running, so it needs a timer signal. Yeah, and then uh, you know what's left is the um, one chip, which does the step up to high voltage to send signals out, and then a chip for all the signal, all the wires coming in. You know, way at the top there, there's the, the incoming. Everything that's being fed into the computer, the chip on the right side is translating the voltage level so that it's right. You know, the zero to five standard that you know every other chip in the computer uses. Right. But the the connector that we use has uh, nine pins on it, and when the standard came out a lot of years before, it, it could be used for uh, Navy radio teletype printers and a Western Union telegram printer. And so there's 25 pins on this, and there, there's a pin for every frickin' everything, even ringing the bell on the, on the printer. And so what Kent was mentioning a minute ago was that uh, they would that that connector there was down to the most essential nine of those wires, but they had to do with all kinds of flow control, like the printers out of paper, things like that. And so uh, some modems would turn those wires on in the way we expect, and other modems didn't. And some would let them float. I mean, it was terrible. Or leave them unconnected. Or leave them unconnected. Yeah. And for some of those. It'll say, wait, busy, stop. And if the pin's not connected to anything, you're going to be stopped forever. And so I, the other thing, those zigzaggy lines there, they essentially leak, leak a current through so that if the pin out on the connector isn't connected to anything, there will be some current flow through there that will tell, the, tell, the tell that pin to go wake up. You know, and say, you know, give us the thumbs up and go. Right. So it wasn't frozen, so to speak. Yeah. And with, if you didn't have those, then somebody would have to take the plastic shell off the connector and solder, like, you know, maybe wrap it with a bit of steel wool, steel wool cloth, you know, to join those pins together. Right. Or if it was, or later if it wasn't supposed to be there, then they'd, they'd have to start cutting pins away. Right. And so those things I stuck in there 
they could be overridden ridden if, if they actually connect, properly connected those pins. But if the pins weren't connected right, then it would sort of take over and then get everything going. So back a couple years ago, we collaborated to create a uh, blog post that describes all this. And there's a few things we realized that we had forgotten at the time. So I'll just read a few of these. Um, so there's a crystal, as I said, providing a clock signal, right? So that it knows how fast 300 baud is, because it's dividing a clock signal by a certain number of times. And it knows, it thinks that's 300 baud. Well, if you double the clock signal, then you lose the slowest baud rate in the table in the chip, but you gain a baud rate that's double the max at the top end, right? So we decided since to that, do that. Since that way of connecting had gone way, way back in time to way, really way old, back slow to 50 baud. Side. Yeah, 50, which is ridiculously slow. We figured we could do without that. And it's like, you know, 300 and up. Right. And during our prototyping, we realized, we realized that the Commodore in the right, with the right software could handle double the standard maximum, so 38,400. So that was the top baud rate that it would do. Uh, and as, to make sure that worked, we used the 2 megahertz A version of the 6551. You can see in the schematic there's a 6551A. It runs the 2 megahertz to make sure it could keep up with these faster bodies. If rates. you spend a little more money, you can get the chip with faster transistors in it. Right. We used the MAX 234, and in a minute I'll explain, we actually started to use a, a, a chip by a competitor named Cypex. The 234 rather than the 232 version. Um, because it, it had different variations of how many signal lines and things like that. The 234 had the right stuff that we needed. Because we could use that MC1489 to do the stuff going the other direction way cheaper. Uh, that was a much cheaper chip. So it, it, you what you want to do is, if you want to take those really high, like plus 12 volts and negative 12 volts, and you want to reduce them, that's utterly simple circuit-wise. You don't need, to, you don't need to, to produce, you know, two times or four times voltage. Right. And so the, the, the one on the left uh, has that cool voltage booster section in it. And there's enough pins on it to do four wires. And so, some people, they'll go bare minimum and they'll say, okay, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have one wire coming in for receiving data, one wire for the go stop, and then likewise on the other direction. So you know, they'll, of the whole line pins on there, they'll only hook up four of them. And you can kind of get away with that. But the thing is, because we wanted a ton of compatibility, the guy on the left has the transmitted data, and then you know three more, which are you know ready to send, clear to send, busy, all you know, all the proper protocol for for controlling all kinds of devices. Right. So you know they offered one of the a, a chip and where you know all of them were outgoing sections, and then so we just went with the second chip, the one on the right that does the incoming. Yeah, it was a lot more cost effective. And then we learned some things about the 6551, right, which is Commodore's chip. Um, The 6551's receiver section is disabled when the DCD line, which is data, data carrier detect, is inactive. We think to probably cut down on garbage characters and spurious interrupts and stuff, but that meant we couldn't get an echo for modem commands, right? You remember when you would talk to a modem, you would type in AT for attention, and you would say something to the modem, and you want to know if the modem heard you and understood it? Well, that wouldn't work because it would never respond. So we swapped those two lines at the chip so that we could basically fake it out so that we could hear the modem talking to us. One of those, you know, be, on that nine pin connector, one, two and three are, are just data pulses going out and data pulses coming in. Everything else is status information. And carrier detect just meant that, okay, you placed your phone call, the other guy answered, and he started screaming like a fax machine. Oh, okay, now. You have two modems in different cities, and they've just, you know, they've established their connection. But like Kent just mentioned, there are times when you're typing along and you're telling your modem what number should you dial. Well, if the data carrier detect line was off, which it wouldn't be because you hadn't made the call yet, you'd be typing these, these numbers and nothing's coming back on your screen. There's no loop back. Right. So you're kind of typing blind. Right. And so we kind of said, okay, we're going to do this differently. You know, we're going to 
change it away from what it says in the spec sheet so that people can actually see what they're typing. Right. And some terminal software actually listened for those characters to know if, them, if a piece of software sent the command to them and got it. And then there's this other thing in the RS-232 spec called a ring indicator line, RI. The 6551 didn't implement it, so we didn't do anything with that. Um, in the Commodore memory map, there's, you know, you have to, the, the, I'm pointing to my laptop uh, as if it's a Commodore, but over here, that port maps directly into memory. That's how, you know, the chip actually enters the memory map. And so we had a little solder pad you could change from the default of DE00, you could change it to DF00. Because some people who had lots of hardware expansion cartridges wanted to be running more of them one of them at a time, and they couldn't all be looking, sitting maybe, in the same Maybe you want space. your SID Symphony and your model. Maybe you want to listen to stereo SIDs and be <laughs> online and be super cool. <laughs> That's right. And then the DSR trace, data set ready, had to be able to be severed easily. So we made a little, two little pads with a tiny little piece of solder in between it. Because the practical peripherals modem, anybody heard the name of that company in 30 years? Uh, their PN, PM2400SA, which was a very popular 2400 baud modem, really undercut haze on price. Um, it wouldn't work right with the DSR uh, enabled. And it was a huge manufacturer modem. So they're like, well, we're not going to do it that way. We're not going to follow the spec. Thanks, guys. Um, and then there was a slide switch. Uh, I'm pointing to the picture that's not there. Uh, there was a slide switch in the cartridge. That's because we needed to be able, this is kind of nerdy, we need to be able to change the kind of interrupt that was driving the chip. Uh, everything in Commodore mode on the computer used the non-maskable interrupt line. But if you were one of those really cool people using CPM on a Commodore 128, for God knows what reason, <laughs> That software was written where it had to be IRQ, had to be the interrupt request line. So we need to have a switch in there, again, because we were trying to go for the ultimate compatibility. We could have told people, sorry, it doesn't work with CPM. We thought, eh, it's just a slide switch. You know, it didn't cost that much money. So we're going to pass it around the something. Thing to, that was like, oh, finally, they're coming into the new era. You know, yeah. See, you know, not MS-DOS, but CPM, but at that point, they, they, either one looks just as good as the other. So I'm going to pass around, and I'm really sorry, as I mentioned, that Noel's not here. He saved the prototype that Brian built for him to do testing. Noel was the first person who tried to write software for the cartridge, because we needed somebody to bootstrap, and we wanted to, again, part of this whole thing about... You need sample code. need sample code, so he was willing to write it, so we had to get him a prototype. Brian, why don't you describe what it took to make this? You can point to the screen, and I'll pass this around for people to see it. Uh, if I can get the cartridge on. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead. Uh, just well, point to that. Off. Oh, okay. before, I, before I send Well, it. one thing I was going to mention is uh, one thing I noticed about this cartridge is right where the cord's going through, it's not even cut at a 90 degree angle. Right. And that's, that's because right. one of my midnight jobs was at a steaming, smelly dungeon that etched circuit boards for companies, you know, that were building medical equipment. The dumpster was full of all the scrap blank board where it was just all copper foil. And so that prototype was just a scrap I grabbed out of the dumpster when my shift was over. <laughs> it wasn't even cut square. Yeah, it's true, it's not cut square. But the, uh, most people, if you wanted to make your board at home, you kind of did this photography process. Right. And for all the effort you're gonna put in, it's like, well, you're probably gonna make 50 or 100 of these boards. It's like, no, no, I just want one. And so what this company came out with was uh, a sort of a transparency film. You could run it through your copier. Laser printer. Or your laser printer. Yeah. And um, the, the powder, which in the, the toner, was uh, basically styrofoam cups in powder form. And the printing that you get off of a copier or a laser printer all the black in there is a thin plastic film. And so what you do is uh, you'd make a t-shirt iron on, but you'd iron it onto, a, onto the copper foil blank board. So you get this, you get this transparency out of, the, out of the copy machine, and then you yeah, iron then, it onto the board. You know, because of the heat, you had a plastic, you, take, you, you put a pillowcase like you're doing an iron-on transfer for a t-shirt, and then you let it cool and very gently lift very it off. Gently. And the clear plastic sheet was presumably didn't hold as well as the toner mounted onto the copper foil. Right. 
And then you'd come along with a, a drafter's pen and you'd fill all the pinholes on the rips and everything. But what was great is now you had this one board and you put it in the etching solution and it's switched switch it around like you're developing film. Another and it, thing that it chews away right all, all the places where you don't want copper foil get chewed away because they don't have this protective skin. Right. So uh, that those those special plastic sheets that just come on the market. Another so thing I should have had that on a lot the, of experiment. I should, I, I should have put that on the first or the uh, no no project is an island that made it really affordable to do prototyping because before yeah. it was awfully expensive or you had to breadboard it. Everybody know what breadboarding is? All the little God Almighty, you know. <laughs> Especially if it's in a cartridge, how are you going to fit that damn thing into the computer, right? So. Yeah, the, 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 the trick of the thing was the, the connector that jammed into the computer had to be just the right dimensions. Right, yeah, the, the stuff, these fingers. And as Brian said, every time you did one, you got another surprise. It's like, well, which traces didn't glue down this time? But you know, you made two or three of them and then chose the one that was the least worst and fixed it up with the little, with the pen. Yeah, and notice this this uh, has a 25 pin RS-232 cable on it, this prototype does. Um, uh, Hardwired in, um, whereas later we put a DV9, that would be a female on the cartridge, I think, right? Yeah. Because the cable's Oh yeah, well, the, the, yeah, we'll the, I, the, the IBM personal computer had places that stand up boards that you plug in and a little opening on the back and so IBM was the one who said, hey, yeah, there's 25 of these pins in here. We're going to go down to the nine essentials. And so we're just going to make a connector, which we're saying is new shape RS-232. And so that's what we adopted for our cartridge. I mentioned a minute ago that uh, we tried to use a competitor to Maxim made by Cypex because it was so much cheaper. Uh, and they were touting it as being 100% compatible. There's a company making a knockoff of the right. of the cool, expensive, first on the market, you know, with the, the cool charge pump thing in it. Yeah, and we, we found that it didn't actually work like it was supposed to. And it caused lots of trouble. People would try things that wouldn't work, and some of the chips blew up. And Cypex first said, well, you're, you're sending too much voltage, you're blowing the chip up. And we knew we weren't, but we knew we needed to show due diligence. And so some of the modifications to the V1, V1.1, V1.2 schematic that I showed a minute ago were about protecting some of those signal lines to keep them from going under or over voltage. We put other components in to keep it really in a narrow band. And still, the chips were failing. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute, what we ended up doing. But uh, that was some of the work we did. It was really not strictly necessary for the design, but it was to prove our point to Cypex, basically. So uh, there's another picture of the prototype, which I'm passing around. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess that's what we're talking about now. Yeah, sorry about that. I jumped the gun. But yeah, this was the Cypex that we tried to use. It just wasn't working for us, unfortunately. Um, so as we kind of hinted at before, this wouldn't have gone anywhere really without software to use it, right? Because modems needed what was known as a terminal program in order to communicate, to send files, dial up the bulletin boards, talk to a mainframe computer, whatever it was. And by uh, this time, 88, 89, early 1990, there was a very rich set of terminal programs available for the Commodore 64 and even some that were really, really nice for the Commodore 128 in the much desired 80 column mode, right? Because a lot of places, both of words and things you were talking to were 80 columns of display instead of 40. So we knew that for this to be a success, we needed to jumpstart the software. Because the software already existed, we needed to convince a non-zero number of people who were selling or giving away terminal programs to support this chip because they needed to rewrite their routines to talk to the real chip. It wasn't a lot different than the internal as they called it back in the day, bit banging software routines. Thank you. But it was enough different that it was going to take some work. So, oh, thank you. So this is where Noel came in. Uh, he took it upon himself to figure it out. So we had in the prototype and said, good luck. Uh, it was a little bit more than that. But um, So these are the application notes that he ended up writing. He was actually quite a good writer as well as a uh, programmer. Um, and that stuff exists out on the, on the blog that we talk about. Um, 
and this is the sample code here, just the beginning of it. Um, good old 6502 assembly language, nothing like it. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of the programs, we had six people, we had kind of felt like we were like a big company suddenly. We had a software development program for this. So we had six people jump on the wagon. First was this thing called DesTerm 128 uh, by a guy in Canada who was just a little bit older than we were. Uh, but I thought I couldn't resist putting screenshots of this stuff in here because I haven't seen most of these things for years. Mm -hmm. So that was the title, splash screen, and this is kind of the setup for the, uh, the modems. And you can see it uh, went pretty high. He even supported 57.6 later because We'll talk about this, but the company that bought this product from us uh, doubled it again to talk to the really fast 57.6 k baud modems that came out shortly after we got out of the business. And then there was uh, Gary Farmer, Dialog 128, and I actually brought my copy of Dialog 128. I do believe I'll pass that around <laughs> just for fun. I mean, it's obviously you can't see the software run, but there's something about the tangibility of this, you know, since it's 30 years old or whatever. Gary was a super great guy. Another Canadian, actually. Binders from the office supply store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he had a three-hole punch. Yeah. So this was the uh, splash screen for it. This was a commercial program. Max was shareware. This was a commercial program. No readme files, just real paper. Yeah, real paper back in the day. And so this was the setup screen for it. Also Commodore 128, meeting column mode. Um, and then he had a special little utility you ran to Tell it you were going to use a Swift link with it, um, and then Nick Rossi, who grew up in where did Nick grow up? Everyone, Snohomish, Snohomish, Washington. Yeah, he lives in the Bay Area now. He's been uh, in software engineering his whole career. He was transitioning from high school to um, he went to uh, one of the Claremont colleges down in California. I can't remember if it was Harvey Mudd, maybe that's one of them, isn't it? Isn't it one of the Claremont colleges? He, anyway, so he ended up staying in California, but uh, he was a really great guy to work with. So he was a little bit younger than we were, just a little bit. But, uh, any of you remember Nova Term back from Commerce 64 days, right? That's uh, so he added support for that in his version 9.1, and uh, looks like this. Look at that modem Swift link. We felt so proud. <laughs> and then a guy named Phil Kemp. Uh, who we, we didn't actually know. He approached us. He heard about it. He did a really great job. Terminal One's a really great program for the Commodore 64. He modified it for SwiftLink. Um, see what that looks like. And then uh, we actually found a guy who was willing to modify a CPM terminal program. I was so proud of myself for tracking down somebody. But he was super cool. He was from England, I think, because he had a really cool accent. Never met him. Um, in fact, I ne we only met in person, Nick and Gary, out of all the people that were in the program. So even back in those days, things happened over the wire, so to speak. But uh, David modified Q-Term, uh, as you can see, for the Commodore 128 Swift Link 232, which was super cool. And he because just did that out of the business of display, You could use the Commodore 128 for business. Woo! Processing. That's right. Um, and then Noel, of course, uh, wrote uh, both the sample routines and he also wrote a file transfer program because we thought it might be fun to just kind of throw that in so people could move files back and forth with some other computer like their Amiga or Macintosh or Apple II or something. Uh, so uh, then we went into production. So I've got some of the cartridges here, the production cartridges. Um, this was pretty much the closest thing you had to networking between the computers back in the day. So I won't open this one up if you don't mind, but I will pass it around. This is what it looks like on the inside. Brian, you want to give us a little tour there of the components? Oh yeah. Uh, the um, because the connector is on the rear, it made sense to have the uh, voltage shifting chips, you know, real, real close. They're you know they're an intermediate between this guy, which has by far almost all of the circuitry in it. And this guy has a whole lot of wires because you needed a bunch of those to make the cartridge wired right in, you know, as if it was originally part of the main circuit board. The, um, uh, that switch there was, you know, a couple of options. They were at the NMI or IRQ, right? 
yeah, to um, decide, uh, you know, this main guy, he, he would either, you know, this, this wire here or this wire here. The simplest thing was just, just to have a straight line right up to that switch. We didn't put the switch on this side because when the cartridge is plugged in, the switch would be covered over. It actually recessed a little in the Yeah, I think that pad actually is the memory, where the memory map was. Oh yeah, that, that's a that's the kind of thing that you would do once when you buy the cartridge and never have to change it. We figured you could get to it mostly without having to open the cartridge. Oh yeah, that's the other thing is the, this little scrub line was, you know, this was the part that hung outside of the shell. So you could take a little exactly. And so you could, just, you could just tip it and you know, rub through this to make the change that you wanted to make. Again, that was kind of our thing. We wanted to make it as easy, yeah. as, easy, la, 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 as easy as possible for people to modify these things. So just try to think it through as much as, much as you could. OK, so what are some things else we might want to say about production? Um, Brian got uh, production cartridge number one. Do you know where it is? Do you still have it? Yeah. Oh, good, good. And uh, this one's number two uh, from Noel, and I have number three. Um, and we sold about 115 of them at 30 bucks a piece, 29.95. And then we had a general price increase because postage and crap like that was going up. Components were going up, so all of our products went up a little bit. And so um, we went up to 35 dollars, 34.95. We sold 47 more, um, and we would have kept going, but. Uh, by that time, Noel, Brian, and I were all working at Microsoft, and it's like finals week all the time. All the time, <laughs> back in those days, and we, you know, this was always just for fun. And frankly, we were starting to see the handwriting on the wall about the growth and continued investment in 8-bit Commodore computers. I we're mean, going, as much as we're we going to the club meetings, which is how he and I actually met. And Noel, but and Noel, and, but by that time, you're starting to see. People, the crowd shrinking. Right, not and, a lot of new people. Yeah, and then kind of going to sort of a social club, like the bar at Cheers. Right, which was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so we decided to, and this is all out on our blog, but we decided to sell to a company that we really, really respected, Creative Microdesigns or CMD. They made some amazing, amazing products. They're way more sophisticated than we ever attempted. Things that took over the entire computer and did you know, that rambling product they had, and they brought a hard drive onto the market. I mean, it was crazy stuff they were doing. And they were interested in the Sid Symphony and the SwiftLink, and we're like, oh my God, please. You know, we'd love to see this continue to be available, and if it could be somebody, not us, doing it, that'd be great. So we worked out an agreement, we sold it to them. And we sold them 48 more that we had assembled at cost. Um, and so all the circuit boards were produced to the 1.0 schematic, that first one I showed you, but all cartridges shipped to the 2.0 schematic, which was the third version, because we never, we, we knew what 2.0 was before we uh, sold any cartridges, but we didn't want to go back and revise the board because there was a, like a $300 setup charge or something for that, a new circuit board. That, that beige thing way at the top. Uh, right, that's, that's the, the That leg that goes way over there and up. That was that was one of the originally uh, that guy was going to go through that empty hole that that silver donut and it's not unusual for you even now you get a product and you take the back off and there's extra things tacked on that they found that they needed once they started getting up to customers right and um, well, one thing I should say is Brian uh, is a very humble person but he spent hours trying to reduce this thing called hole throughs. Anybody remember what a hole through is on a circuit board? Now we're getting like super extra geeky. That's where you need to get from one side of the circuit board to the other, you need to change sides. And so he kept optimizing and optimizing and optimizing. Got the number of hole throughs way, way down, which saved us money. The, the, one of the prices of making the board is, in some cases, this line's going long and there's a line, there's some other foil line already take going through, and it's like. It's like Tron. I kind of want to steer around, yeah, like the motorcycle game in Tron. And when they're trying to squish a circuit board really small, they'll drill a hole and put nothing in it, but the factory will dip it in a copper plating bath so that this donut on this side of the board 
Oh, when you turn these over, there's lines on both sides. Uh, they'll put it in a plating bath so that uh, there's a copper plating through the board. Through the board, and you know there's a charge for every one of those. And so each of these parts, for each leg, it had to have a hole drilled anyway. So one of like the mental, you know, puzzle solving things is, well, if this hole is drilled, what if I just bring a line on this side? continue it on the back side of the board and then pop it back to the front side again. And so it's like, you know, you have this rat's nest of individual wires and it's like, well, I'm going to put this one here, put this one here, put this one here. You just kind of want to untangle those so that none of them are crossing. It's like 3D chess at Star Trek, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I meant to mention, before I forget any further, Noel brought this book when he was here earlier, but uh, you remember the file transfer program I mentioned a minute ago? Uh, we thought, well, we might as well go through the motions. There's something more to learn. We uh, tried to um, copyright it. And uh, it was really funny. The copyright office rejected the, uh, rejected the submission. And Noel had this book. I think he told me, I can't remember, but he got it like, I think he got it like, or you, maybe you found it at Half Price Books or something. But anyway, and it says, do this in this order. Say this thing using this exact language. And we just made the exact change, sent it, and they accepted it. It was just funny. <laughs> it's like, you know, you wonder if they actually just understood what we were order. saying. Probably not. But, you know, we checked all the boxes, so they, uh, they approved it. So he brought that book, which I thought was great. He's held on to it all these years. Okay, so, uh, and one last thing uh, I know Noel would love to talk about if he were here. Um, that connector, right? So it's a plastic shell. If you all saw the shells have a hole in it for that connector to come out. Well, those shells don't come with those holes. So Noel, I'll just read this to you. Um, Noel remembers Brian and me descending on his house with a box of cartridge shells to figure out how to cut openings for the DB9 connector for the first hundred cartridges. We bought the circuit boards in batches of 100. Noel set up his Sears router table on top of the clothes dryer in the basement. We were big time boys. <laughs> his wife had given him the router and table for Christmas and he had used it only once or twice. As Noel remembers, I'd seen Norm Abrams use routers on this old house. <laughs> so I figured I knew what to do. I did, sort of. We got openings cut in all 100 cartridge shells at least large enough to allow the DB9 connector to peek through. <laughs> I don't think any of the openings came out exactly the same shape and most probably had enough room for small rodents to squeeze in alongside the connector. We probably drilled the holes for the IRQ and MI switch switches that night too, but I don't remember for sure. Yeah, that's kind of a blur to me too all these years ago. Well, it's like a drill press and go, ah. Right. And then this cone thing chews a hole, a round hole. Right. But then the other thing, the router is is like that dentist tool that whirls at incredibly high speed and it's like, ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be really careful. So, yeah, he, he had a jig on it so that you could, uh, you could take the shell and just sort of do this slide rotation motion. Right. And it would stab, cut, stab, exit. Right you to use the routines other places and that's Craig Bruce is ACE and Swift Live or Swift Live maybe and then several bulletin board programs uh, supported the Swift Link. Um, CBase and Color64 I believe supported it uh, when we were kind of in the in the mix and were aware of it and then a few others Omni 128, DTJ, Image, etc. Oh, it looks like those two were specifically later. Maybe Omni 128 was also during the time that we were heavily involved. But later on, some other stuff was added, was updated as well. One of the reasons why you'd see a lot of program software still coming out after so many years was uh, the some of the guys who still, for fun, write programs. They said, "Well, here's a whole computer that fits on one fold-out sheet of paper." And you can you can keep the whole design in your head, and so it's, it's it's practical for one person to understand the whole computer instead of a team of, of software people working on an IBM compatible program. Right. And so you know you you could in a few weekends you know you, you could actually turn out something that worked, and the computers have been on, around long enough that you could uh, pick them up at garage sales really cheap, and. For a simple job like calling into a bulletin board system, it worked just fine. Yeah, very much so. There were a lot of seniors here in the Seattle area that had Commodores and loved them. They were, there were a lot of senior 
people at the University of Washington Commodore User Group, which was the group Brian's referring to. And then publicity-wise, we did have several articles. We sent you know press releases and stuff out to the magazines. By 1990, the market was starting to cons consolidate. You know, people were moving on to other types of computers slowly. So, and also because this wasn't really as quite as easy to understand as the Sid Symphony was, that kind of uptake and the enthusiasm with the magazines wasn't as fast. But in 1991, in particular. The modem thing kind of really hit hard, you know, faster modems really hit hard in the Commodore market. Hard meaning good, like a lot of excitement. And so our product was out by then. Uh, and so we got included in several articles about higher speed modems and connectivity and things like that. And, and also involved in this was the whole handover to uh, CMD. Uh, Commodore World was CMD's in-house magazine. And they featured the, the SwiftLink several times. And then uh, real quickly here, uh, you can figure out probably which two are Brian and me. And then in between us is Gary Farminer, the guy that wrote Dialogue 128. Uh, we actually went to a um, uh, Commodore World, I think is what it was called, or something like that, right? Because that, that was the name of the magazine. Was that also the name of the, um, gosh, I forget. Uh, that didn't seem right. I didn't write it down here, but whatever the... There's an expo hall. There's an expo tables, hall. Tables yep. of stuff to sell. World of Commodore. World of Commodore, not Commodore World. Thank you. I knew I was close, but not, not right. So that was something Commodore and a third party, I think, sponsored for several years. Philadelphia, New Orleans, Las Vegas, it moved around. Uh, but we got to go there and meet Gary and uh, hawk our wares, so to speak. We were pretty unsophisticated. We didn't even know how to take credit cards or anything like that. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. We got there and realized that we didn't even have a cigar box to put the money in. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. We had cartridges to sell. We did manage to remember to take the cartridges. Yeah. That was in September of uh, 1990 that we did that. And so you can see the hats. Uh, I don't know if Gary still has his hat or not. Uh, and then uh, we did sell things to Creative Micro Designs, and they continued production. You can see a slight change to the, um, to the label. I'll pass one of those around. No. Or, you know, I don't actually have one of those. That's, uh, I'm wrong about that. I took a photo of that at Convex uh, 2013, I think. I took a photo of some fellow brought one. So I don't actually have their Swift Link. But what I do have is this thing I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so they continued on with our design. Um, and uh, they did a few things which we thought were further improvements. They, uh, um, they provided more information about how to change that DSR jumper, and um, they also switched to a Rockwell version of the 6551 instead of UMC, who we've been buying them from. They may have had a, a, a contract with them to get it cheaper. We know they manufactured and sold at least 741 more of them because they were paying us royalties, but as things got later in their company, they started to have financial problems, which was kind of sad. I mean, it's just the way the market was going. So The royalty wasn't enough for us to pester them about it. No, we didn't. We so, were just happy to see that somebody was still going. Right. So they may have sold more, and maybe they didn't send us quite all the royalties they were supposed to. We didn't really care. But based on the records I have, they sold at least 741 more of them. Um, and then this next thing here is their product that replaced uh, Swiftlink. So I was really blown away because I had totally kind of disconnected from Commodores by 93 or 94. I was, you know, I had a girlfriend and uh, I was working like a crazy guy and so I had just kind of lost touch. But later I found that they actually went back and revised the Swiftlink um, architecture. The first thing they did was they increased the clock chip again and lost one more baud rate at the bottom end. They lost 110 baud, but they, get, they gained 57.6k baud at the top end because that became a thing with modems. And then there are two mystery chips that they have papered over, the mysterious U2 and U3. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on there, but I mean, Mark, uh, I don't remember Mark's name. Does anybody Fellas? remember? Mark Fellows? Mark Fellows. He was super bright. So whatever they did, I'm sure it was good stuff. <laughs> So, I mean, it was sort of like our cartridge, but different. Um, and it worked the same. It would work with the same software. And they may have asked some of the software providers to add one more baud rate at the top, you know, to get 57.6. And they marketed that cartridge exclusively or extensively in their magazine. Because by that time, 1994 or so, 393, they quickly became the only Commodore monthly magazine left, really. 
um, things consolidated pretty significantly. And they continued marketing it through 96, um, uh, right into, it looks like 1999, they were still advertising, and then the magazine shut down. So it, was, it had a, a long, long life, a lot longer than I expected. And they, um, uh, and they had uh, jumpers, so they got rid of the cutting the circuit board traces, you know, to change memory. They, they went to this little, uh, I forget what the standard is well, there, but it's a, it's a jumper a, based thing. There's, there's little rigid posts. Right, you just pop and it off. There's a, a little sleeve with a metal lining, and uh, it accomplishes just the same thing as a, as a moving switch would. But uh, you can move them in different shapes so that you, you can essentially create this custom switch that you couldn't normally build or right off the shelf. It was nicer than, it was cheaper than doing a lot of slide switches, less clumsy because you didn't need to change it very often, but it was nicer than having to cut a trace on the circuit board. Oh, yeah, that was, that was one of the things. There's, there's a couple of points in there where it was a thing that you would only change once, and so you'd take a, a sharp blade and rock it back and forth and, until it had worn through the copper foil. Right. And of course, these are reversible. You can change it back if you want to. Right. Uh, and then just kind of to wrap up, as I kind of got back into the retro scene, my son Kyle and my younger son Sean, to some degree, started asking me about this Commodore stuff. Nice. I still had the equipment and you know, I kind of got back into it in 2011, 2012. I was amazed to find that there were, um, some of them are more or less clones of the SwiftLink or the Turbo 232 and others are you know, just a different for reasonable reasons. But I just couldn't believe that all these things had come onto the market. Uh, it just blew me away. So I just, thank you. I, I didn't view it, I know Brian didn't either, there was anything to be upset about. He was like, wow, you know, imitations of Sincere's form of flattery, right? So we had uh, four pieces of Sincere flattery here. The uh, pitch link, which was advertised. I, I don't, I've never seen one. There's this link 232, and then the G, which is the Jim Brains. I know that sold. And then G Link 232, which is pictured, but I don't know if they, uh, it looks done. Uh, yes, they have it. I haven't put my hands on one. I'd like to have one just for fun, you know, just to kind of go in the museum. And then Daniel Mackey's clone, which is shown at the right there, which I think is descended from the Link 232, but he said it's actually descended from the Swift Link. So, but uh, Daniel's a great guy. He comes to Convex most years, doesn't he? Uh, no, never. Oh, no, he hasn't. Oh, he comes to the Chicago one, maybe. He, yeah, he lives way out yeah, he's east, a, he's New York. East Coast. Uh, New Jersey, I think. New Jersey, yeah. I thought he had been to Convex, my mistake. So yeah, anyway, it's he's still the 234 chip. Yeah, so that may be a SwiftLink clone, but he's yeah. you can buy those today from you know he runs a makes a run of them every now and then. Um, so that's really it. Thank you. Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is really just a place to have an easily web searchable entry point to the various blog postings I've made. Brian and Noel helped me. I wrote a story <coughs> about every product Dr. Evil Labs did and put it on Commodore server. Mm. Dot com, which is uh, Greg uh, Alicles. Alicles. I can never remember how to pronounce his last name. I'm sorry, Greg. Um, a site that has all kinds of great file downloads and uh, user blogs. And then the Facebook page just points basically to those blog entries because Facebook is where more people seem to be these days. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can answer. Nobody fell asleep. Thank you. <laughs> That's really awesome, Robert. Uh, so, with these people making Swiftly clones, do you expect a little bit of royalty or no? No. <laughs> e even when CMD was selling a lot of them, it, it, it didn't touch our, our paychecks. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was an insignificant amount of money, but it was still it was cool to get a paycheck or a, a yeah, royalty yeah. check. Like, I got a royalty check. It's like I'm a real author. I'm a real author. I'm a real screenwriter. Yeah, I'm a real screenwriter, right? <laughs> It was fun, but uh, I just, again, I did, we just view it as really cool flattery, right? It's, it would matter enough to people to actually do something like it years later. That, that was uh, payment enough, really. And uh, for the Turbo 232, uh, was that design based off the SwiftLink, or was that just a completely different design? We haven't really disassembled it. I mean, it's similar, right? Uh, the 6551 is in about the same place. 
they have a lot of the same. Well, I think what it comes down to jumpers is and things. The originally, that the thing in the silver can. That's the crystal, uh -huh. right? Uh, goes right into this this big guy here, uh -huh. and uh, it um the the different table the say 16 different data rates you can pick. It's like this frequency divided by 16, this frequency divided by 32, this divided by 64. But the, a lot of the modems that came out over time, they didn't, they didn't in one leap, they didn't just double the, the data rate. The, the data rate went up a little bit. And so what, uh, what, this, what these chips did was um, there's a, if you wanted to ignore the internal table of, of, of speeds and say, you know, I have, I have some funky, you know, arc welding <laughs> machine and I want to run it at a custom baud rate, you could uh, hook a, a different speed signal into one of these pins and use that to make the data rate. You know, you're just feeding a signal that's 16 times faster than you want to go with your communication. And one of the things they did was some fancy chips. Uh, later on, the chips you could buy off the shelf continued to get more and more sophisticated. And one of the things that they offered were chips that could synthesize a custom frequency. Mm. And so the, the faster modems that came out after we sold ours, uh, you know, 28.8 baud, uh, 33.6 baud, uh, and then right around 56k, I think 57, was, the, six, yeah. was the fastest modem that they ever came on the market. Mm -hmm. And so that by um, having a, a chip added on that could stand in place of this guy, it was an alternate set of speeds that it could do. And that, is that what that's going on there? Yeah. Ah, uh, I see. So it was more programmable, I guess. Yeah, it's like the, the table and the chip had a dozen standard frequencies. This chip kind of was like an overlay that extended that table so that you could get more fast ones. Yeah, because the, the crystal isn't, isn't actually faster than the one we were using. Right. They were doing it another, another way, so it's doubling or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so it's kind of based on the Swift Link to answer your question, but they, the, he, because Mark is a smart guy, he's like, oh, if I do this and add these chips, I can do this custom Sp thing and we can, go, extra speeds. we can go up into the stratosphere. I know that uh, CMD advertised that when you use the super CPU with the Turbo, uh, I'm sorry, Turbo 232, mm -hmm. you get speeds up to 230,000 BPS. But I don't know if anyone using it at that speed. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. That, that would be good if you had a factory floor oh. and you were running a cord. Sure. Uh, or two computers connecting, you want to go super fast. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, if you wanted to, if you wanted to move some data around, mm. you know, and you know, because of the, the high voltages they were using, it was designed from the beginning to go thousands of feet if you wanted to. Right, plus, plus 12 and minus 12, roughly. Any other questions? Ah, yes. I, I heard rumors that uh, people are trying to replicate the two, Turbo 232. It's just those mystery chips that, that are holding them back and uh -huh. trying to figure out what goes on inside those mystery chips. The CMD was no stranger to custom logic. I uh, mean, this no, is no. in the days before Arduinos and things like that, so it wasn't as cheap and inexpensive and reprogrammable as it is now, but they were doing a lot of custom logic for you know, their super CPU and those kinds of products, so I bet that's some sort of you know, less sophisticated version of that kind of custom logic, probably. I wonder if Mark Fellows is still with us. He's really, he and the, uh, the fa there was a father and son family that were the business side of CMD, whose names I've forgotten, I've got it written down at home, but I haven't had any contact with any, and they don't seem to be showing up in retro circles or anything. They, uh, they were based in Western Massachusetts. Right. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Oh, oh, oh we do, so we yeah. More questions. So did you have any challenges using the expansion? that, you know, people have other cartridges, we always had that challenge with, you know, wanting to run more than one cartridge at a yeah, time, right? Yeah, you know, so we brought a cartridge extender that is Jim Brain's design, which, of course, came out pretty late, you know, kind of more in the retro years rather than the 
but there were a number of cartridge expanders you could buy, and that's partly why we had the DE to DF thing you could cut, is because if you had another cartridge that needed to be in the memory map, the place everybody seemed to put them was DE, and we wanted to at least allow the possibility of being able to move hours to get out of the way, and what we asked all the software authors in their programs to allow that their code to be switched, you know, the user could switch where the, where, what address, what a base, what base address the cartridge showed up in the memory map, as a way to try to get along with the others. But that's about all we could do. There was only a couple to choose from. Uh, and so I imagine some of the super extra power users were probably like, oh man, I can't run four cartridges at once. <laughs> uh, but you know, we did our best. And I've heard, I, I don't know about this, I've heard that some BBS software for the Commodore actually supported two modems, maybe the 128 versions. And you could do that with two Swift links, one set of DE and one set of DF. There's no reason you couldn't do it if, if you could keep up with the serial communication. So that's a possibility. Don't know for sure. Yes? Uh, yeah, I was curious, how did you come up with the name of your company? Dr. Evil Laboratories. So that is on our blog. Uh, I will explain, though. So we didn't know what the heck to call our company. Uh, and a person who we didn't mention at all yet today, so this is great because we can bring him up, is Roy Riggs. So Roy was involved with this uh, very early on, and he is still one of the most talented programmers I've ever come across. Um, he was just light years ahead of anybody I, I knew at my uh, time at Purdue, and he's gone on to a very successful career in software. But um, uh, it came from him, because we were just spitballing. What are we going to call this thing? Uh, I know that you know back in those days, what the public knew about your company was the ad you ran in the magazine. Yeah, so it had to be kind of catchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of companies wanted to sound big, like IBM, so they pick a very collegiate, right. official sounding name. We decided to and not. You, Roy be was not willing that. to just go ahead and say, "Hey, let's just make something completely ridiculous." Yeah. Now this is before the whole Doctor Evil, you know. Uh, movie series. <laughs> yeah. This is before that. Um, so his buddy, whose name I'm forgetting, but it's talked about in the blog post, uh, they had very active imaginations and they used to spend time in like elementary, uh, middle school, whatever, uh, imagining adventures for this guy named Dr. Evil. And so they would imagine what Dr. Evil got into, you know, like drew comics sometimes and did things like that. So like, well, Roy tells us, there was this imaginary character, uh, and we're like, oh, that's kind of cool. So of course he'd have a laboratory, wouldn't he? Cool. And then uh, on the on our uh, website, you'll see a, a, a hand sketch. We, our freshman year at Purdue, we lived across the hall from a guy named Vince Martin, who's a very talented sketch artist, and he got this idea in his head. So he drew this really, you know, crazy mad scientist with the crazy hair, sitting behind the desk with the test tubes and everything. And so that became kind of our, our logo. So that's where it came from. It was really wasn't any, too more complicated than that, but. They didn't um, worry that they would have to attract venture capital to grow international. Yeah, so nor did we. a name that wouldn't work for an international, international company. Nor did we have to worry about doing a um, trademark search or anything like that on the company name. We were pretty sure no, there was no other <laughs> Dr. Evil Laboratories, so. Yeah. That's true, that's a good, good question. Anything else? Thank Ken, you. Kent and Brian, thank you very much. You are.